Welcome to today's webinar on the rise of drones in Australian research space. Uh, my name is Darcy Magalapati from the Australian National Data Service and I'm your host for today. My colleague Karen Visser is behind the scenes co-hosting the webinar with me. This one hour webinar is the second one in this webinar series. Today's webinar will showcase the success stories of drone applications in Australian research space, for example in smart farming, plant phenomics, and data sciences. We will also provide an overview of the recent developments uh, about the research infrastructure and see how we can leverage the benefits of the infrastructure as well as of drone, open drone data. I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Sideshu Guru is the director Turn a Data Science from the University of Queensland. Professor Kim Bryson, Associate Dean, Science Faculty, University of Queensland. Dr. Tim Brown, Director, Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, the Australian National University. Now, I would like to hand over to Dr. Guru for the first presentation. Thank you, Nasima, for the introduction and giving the opportunity to uh, talk about this topic. Uh, so, as Nasima said, I'm Sideshwara Guru. I work for Turn. Uh, so today I'm talking about the uh, making drone data open for scientific research. Uh, so this is a basically the work in progress, you know, what we are exploring and what are the thought process behind that. So just a quick introduction uh, when we say drone. So what is drone? It's just nothing but it's the uh, aerial vehicle. You know, it may be controlled by the uh, on-ground remote control or on-board computer. So drone, you know, it has got different names, you know, commonly used as a UAVs or the RPAS. Uh, I liked RPAS partly because, you know, it's a gender neutral name rather than unmanned. And uh, so predominantly, you know, if it's a rotary wings, it's, it's predominantly called as a drone. And then even the big uh, wings, fixed wings, uh, you know, aerial uh, vehicles are also in this category. Uh, some are pretty big, uh, which is as big as the aircraft, and then uh, which over over the sky and then gather data. And the rotary wings, uh, the smaller one, you know, it's, it runs in a control environment, very fine scale resolution, and then uh, runs predominantly in the battery and then get the data. So the one of the one of the main thing about the drone is you know it become you know quite cheap to run it so that's why it's become quite popular in a various application. So some of the applications is uh, you know drone technology was started in the surveillance and then and now currently you know it's a fair bit of the uh, applications in the agriculture and widely in the environmental space as well. I would call it as a scientific research. And then it's it's a lot used in the disaster recovery, so especially, you know, it's very difficult to send a human being, uh, so the drones are quite popularly used. So in turn, uh, basically, uh, we use drone in the uh, remote sensing uh, capability aspect sort of the thing. Uh, in this context, you know, uh, we use drone basically uh, to de de derive fractional cover uh, to measure vegeta vegetation species composition, uh, to map vegetation characteristics, and then to do some uh, you know stock take, uh, the pastoral stock take, and then even to do the survey, flora fauna survey, kangaroo survey, etc. So for so a lot of data will be derived uh, from the measurement that is done in the drone. Uh, so if you look at, you know, there's a fair bit of the vegetation is on uh, partly because, you know, in the, in the, if you take a satellite remote sensing data, uh, the vegetation composition, I think most of the two-third of the time, you know, uh, it has got the cloud cover over the earth. So a lot of data is measured. So drone is a, a really good technology which runs in underneath the cloud, below the cloud and take a, in a good final resolution. Uh, pictures and then and do the and the researchers can do the analysis so in this uh, context you know the common sensors used in drone uh, so so in drone so basically drone is a platform and then the sensors are uh, you know attached to the uh, to the drone uh, so in our case you know is a fairly popular uh, things used are the uh, the multispectral uh, hyperspectral lidar and the video and the thermal infrared uh, uh, sensors. 
So from a data management perspective, you know, uh, it's uh, basically uh, the cha it's, it's a fair bit of a challenge, partly because it's it's dynamic, both space and by space and time. It's keep on moving uh, uh, at, at the, both the spatial and temporal scale. And then the because of its ability to capture finer scale information, you know, it's it's a massive amount of data is uh, is collected in that one. And the in the uh, so we should have a capability to basically to ingest that and then they process that data and make that data you know, available to the users. And the other part is, you know, there's a fair bit of the commercial uh, companies uh, who work in the drone industry, and even at the research aspect sort of the thing, you know, there's always a partnership uh, with the commercial entity where uh, they will run the drone and then, you know, collect the data and give it to the researchers. Uh, especially there are consultants, especially in the mining uh, uh, community, in the, in the mining area, etc. And the other thing you should be aware that you know you need to you need a permit to do this from a CASA to operate this, and then uh, you should be an operator. You should have a license to the operate this as well. And with all this, you know, the identifying a data owner is important. Um, I, will, I will come to that later why it is important. And if you look at the so for example, to make this data you know openly accessible, you know, just you know, I take a bit of a, a fair principle. Uh, uh, so th these are the four aspect of of the principle. You know, we just see you know, how the drone data will fit in, side of the thing. So if we take the first one, you know, data is adequately described, searchable, and uh, should have an identifier. Uh, so just to give a uh, uh, just to give a uh, bit of a perspective on in the drone, you know, the data is basically the flight flight you know flight plans. And then the you know the files of the you know flight paths and the associated field data you know generally especially you know in in our case uh, and then the raw data files from the uh, measurement it took and then the files and then the you know, the log from the flight and once it's the process then the all the derived products as well. And we should also provide the auxiliary files, like a QAQC files from the you know, processing. So these are the you know, different files you know, uh, that is uh, that is uh, a part of a you know, a data publication aspect. So if you look at you know all these are the you know it's a related interrelated thing. So all this data should be made available, and then the, especially for for the provenance aspect side of the thing, these all these data should be made discoverable, and then that should be accessible. Uh, from a user perspective, and then to make this, you know, data, you know, searchable, and then the you know, identify. So basically, you know, there should be a metadata standard to describe this data. Uh, so we, so you know, we use the ISO standards. Uh, we're not sure whether the, you know, so for example, ISO 19115 completely describe everything or maybe we may have to we may have to provide a, like a customized profile of that ISO standard and then if you make it available as part of a catalog then you know it's a discoverable and then once we put it in a catalog it will have an identifier and then that's that looks fine and then the next aspect is the you know uh, the one of the principles is the data retrieval using open protocol uh, so if you look at the uh, the instruments or the sensors that are used in drone, you know it provides by default provides a uh, as a raw data, you know, from a different file format, and then even at the publication level, if you look at the you know the open standard, you know, in the open data policy, they say that you know uh, all the file format should be of the open format. So the file format, you know, generally in the you know depending on the which of the instruments. You know, it's, it may be a GIF, GeoTIFF, KML shape file, or LAS file, uh, especially in a in a point cloud aspect aspect sort of the thing. So with with such a kind of a veracity of the you know file format, then the tools must be uh, available as well to translate or manipulate even the analyze the data, and then the you know uh, even at the you know. Uh, you know, sometimes it, it may be worthwhile even to provide a program, you know, the R program, or the Python program, where you know they should, they can access this data and then you know, uh, so that they can they can run the analysis aspects of the thing. If it's uh, too confusing, so for example, if somebody don't know, uh, don't have a clue about you know how to access the LAS uh, 
uh, file, then probably it's worthwhile to provide a program so that you know it's embedded, so that you know that is embedded in the embedded in the R program, so that they can start writing the program. Uh, so, so that is one of the thing, sort of the thing. And the next one probably is the uh, the uh, the you know, data use vocabulary and qualified reference to other metadata. And then, so we use a you know a fair bit of a domain specific vocabulary. It's like a, a GCMD is quite popular, especially keyword search was. And then, uh, you know, because the because the drone and the UAV technology has, uh, has has come so fast, probably there may be you know the, it may be invent some of the terminology you know incorporated into the vocabulary so that it's it's accurately represented. Um, uh, with uh, as I was explaining the the different data types and uh, you know when each of the data type each of the you know files should be you know referenced and then it should be made as a link and then hopefully as a persistent identifier and then all those should be a queryable as well and then the uh, the final uh, uh, you know principle is basically data. Uh, uh, metadata in domain relevant community standards with clear data usage license. Uh, so we use a, an ISO standard, you know, it's either 115 or 139 in the domain, uh, which may fit well, as I said before, that, you know, uh, maybe we may have to create a, a profile uh, to accurately represent the, uh, uh, describe the data. And a lot of the standard is fine. Uh, if you want to fit a, a the human actionable uh, in a discovery query and access, that means that the human go and click couple of things. Uh, probably we may have to look at, look at the you know machine actionable, machine access accessible, you know actionable discovery and exploration sort of the thing where you know it's a machine to machine query. Uh, when uh, then that may be an issue, uh, partly because of the uh, so much of the interrelationship uh, uh, with the files and etc. It is also depends on the you know the um, the what kind of file if we are looking at the source file then definitely that will be an issue and then the uh, talk about the data usage you know so what it says is you know oh you should provide as an open license thing even though uh, you know we may say uh, we provide the all our data and the creative commons by attribution the identifying the owner is a key uh, partly because you know even at the Creative Commons attribution, the copyright subsists with the data, and then you need to identify who owns the copyright. Uh, so, for example, if you are if you are a uh, if you are a researcher who is using a consultant to you know, collect the data, so technically, if you look at uh, uh, that aspect, uh, the person who collects the data is the owner of that data, unless you have a contractual obligation arrangement, make sure that the ownership is transferable to the uh, researcher. Uh, so why this is important is that you know uh, uh, for the attribution aspect set of the thing, so that if somebody uses your data, they need to know, you know who is attributed as a researcher. You want the attribution to go to you, not the person who just collected the data. And yeah, and the thing is, if somebody is owner, they can do whatever they want with the data. Uh, the IP is IP is with the owner. So uh, what the what you want is the uh, as a as a principal investigator, you owns the IP about the data. Uh, still, there are a fair bit of a challenge. Uh, one of the thing you know uh, we face is the you know it's just the amount of data set that is you know collected. You know, we still struggle to you know make that data the ingest the data into one place and then they process everything and then the delivery delivery of that data. So we we think that the uh, the cloud platform you know the managed platform to do everything uh, would be a useful thing. And uh, there are few initiatives going on as well at the community level who are looking exactly uh, the similar problems. Uh, 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 so one is the OGC domain working group, and the other one is the RDA interest group. So with all the aspect, you know, we want to, we don't want to change a complete, you know, data management practice of the turn. So we retrospect. Uh, retrofit everything to the turn data management practice. So a lot of the whatever the data you know we intend to you know make the 
metadata and ISO standards, and then catalog in the geo network, and then uh, that is harvested to the you know different repositories, you know discovery portals, so that the data is discoverable, and all the data you know, will have a clear, clear you know attribution statement with Creative Commons by attribution. And then currently we are storing you know, uh, data in the FTP server and then make that link available. Um, and we are still in the process of you know, processing a lot of uh, data. Uh, but having said that, the, uh, the, uh, uh, all the raw files are there. So if somebody is really interested to use that data, they can process the data. Uh, as well, and the other thing, you know, we are we are still working on the you know uh, the effective you know the robust data delivery mechanism as well, so that the uh, user just you know come and access the data and get the data. And one of the thing, you know, we are working on the uh, you know still work in progress is the you know the the portal where you know user can come and get the final products. So we collect uh, you know we have done a campaign across you know eleven sites across uh, Australia. Uh, so we are working on that. They called as a, a the field data, and then we are working on the portal where you know all those love and sites data is accessible as well, especially at the lidar level. So if you look at the uh, drone, you know it it has it is quite popular uh, in the research community. Uh, you know, especially in the environmental science, uh, there is a massive. Uh, uh, uptake of the drone technology partly because of the ease of use and then the final resolution of the data it provides and moving ahead uh, uh, partly you know probably it's worthwhile to you know, build a, an IoT platform uh, for, to manage the research drone data uh, it's not a the, at the institution level, at the overall uh, uh, research level, so this probably enable the interconnection of devices, uh, basically based on the you know, type of sensor you use and what is the application uh, you are running, and that will enable to build a, a common data platform so that the, each of the individual doesn't you know repeat the same grappling with the same problem. And if you look at the at the commercial world, you know this is already happening. Uh, there are a lot of commercial players working in this space. Uh, it may be you know off the shelf as well. And then uh, there are even a lot of the open source technology already you know, started appearing, uh, especially the management aspects of the thing. So what technically uh, what we want in this one is you know, a researcher has got a platform. They put the sensors, they collect the data, and we need a platform where that data is ingested somewhere. The processing happen, and then the uh, and the product derived product is basically available for the third party researcher to to analyze that data. So, so at the individual level, uh, you know, people are working, but the make the everything as a, as a pipeline and then provide that as a service to the complete community. We are still working on that one. It's still a work in progress. Thanks for the opportunity to. Talk about this topic. Thank you, Guru. Uh, it's an ex excellent presentation, very informative. Now I would like to hand over to Kim for second presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Bryson. Thank you very much for inviting me to be participating in this. I'm going to be talking about uh, drones in research in relation to agriculture, and in fact, in education as well. And I think my talk quite nicely segues into some of the things that Guru has been talking about because. The buzz of today's agriculture is around these disruptive technologies, Internet of Things, big data, drone technology, smart agriculture. They're all buzzwords um, and commonly tossed around. And there's been a number of big conferences in the agricultural space and farm management space about how such technologies can be of value to the agriculture and to the whole food science issue of you know producing good quality food in a, in a sustainable way. What we've done at UQ is look at how we can incorporate things like uh, an Internet of Things um, multi-sensor mesh network to collect real-time biophysical data, which we store in the university's cloud. And we've done that around the whole thousand odd hectares of the University of Gatton's regional campus, which has a, is a multi-enterprise agricultural um, centre. And we've also incorporated a second master sensor mesh network around 10 kilometers away from the campus that will look particularly um, in relation to, we've set up a living laboratory there is what we've called, around how we can use this uh, real-time biophysical data with drone technology to look at biomass of pasture in particular, 
um, but that can end up going you know, obviously to, to various crops and vegetation as well. So this network that we set up, it's uh, very flexible. We work with technology um, from Libellium. We can look at different types of communication protocols. So we're not just looking at Wi-Fi, but we're looking at other types of radio interfaces that allow us to transmit data in very in real time over long distances and through buildings and trees, etc. Um, and it's a, a network that is basically self-healing. And we have a number of these nodes um, set up across the campus. Here we go, smart agriculture, smart water, smart environment, and smart security. This last one being, the smart security one being essentially um, the ability through the network to turn things on and off or open and shut gates, which of course is really important from an agricultural perspective. The agriculture one looks at, well in fact I think my next slide looks at um, the types of data that you can gather from these, these sensors when it's installed and we have all of these nodes and most of these sensors uh, are, are around, are around the place. So we're collecting a lot of biophysical raw data in real time which we store in the cloud and have a dashboard to essentially access. The idea is that this is done through open source so that at the end of the day people can have access to this so turn may may be interested in it. Um, other people may be interested in using it, remembering it's subtropical information really for people who are interested in the agricultural space. But we're, we're looking to certainly make that available at the moment through Eduroam to people who are involved in Eduroam rather than anything else. We've tried it on an open network and that we found that it had a risk of the university being hacked through our system. So we closed it down from worldwide access to Eduroam access. So Lots of data, biophysical data coming in and here's a diagram that tells you that we've got data coming in from these various nodes into our, um, into our cloud and then we're using that data within the educational environment now to develop various essentially data uses. So we've got research projects in here but we've got farm operation that is something that we want to do because we'd like this to be developed far more into the agricultural farm space and of course our education component type of data you can get, you can modify all of this through our data dashboard or you can look at um, a QR code and get through to it. So that's the start, but what, when we have this large amount of biophysical data, what else do we need and what for? And of course, we want the data for things like pasture monitoring and management, animal monitoring and management, crop monitoring and management and education and more data. We want to get more data. So drones provide that or satellite data or remote sensing data provide that capability of putting aerial data on top of our, um, our essentially ground and, and ground data collection system. And if you go back to the future, or we're going back to the future in this because remote sensing has been around in agriculture since the early 1970s and the problem for ag in relation to remote sensing were two main data. One was data cost of acquisition and processing, the revisit frequency, the things that Guru have talk, has talked about actually, and also a lack of skills available in the agricultural sector for this type of, type of data to be used efficiently, well, at a, in a cost effective manner. And agriculture people or people in agriculture can be very easily turned off technology. You know, what is the point of technology if it doesn't deliver me a cost benefit in terms of what I'm doing? And if it costs me a lot, and it goes wrong and I can't do it when I want to do it then it's not worth it. So we needed to do something about this lack of skills and what we've done here is look at developing the specialist skills that are needed to understand spatial variability in agricultural remote sensing. We've set up an agricultural remote sensing lab here at the, here at the campus and what we're doing there is we're trying to integrate students from different disciplines across the academic world. So engineering students come down and work on agricultural projects in relation to things like building drones and understanding what drones can be used for, building sensors and understanding what those sensors can be used for in, in agricultural monitoring in particular, but that does involve, of course, environmental monitoring. So our wastewater management site is probably one of our most uh, recorded biophysical data sites. And we, we get them to do hands-on work so they understand the issues and the risks. Uh, we want to use them because they're cheap platform to carry high resolution sensors. You can see here uh, a spatial variability in a paddock at ground level. You can see a bit, but when you look over here at an aerial photo of that paddock, the variability is huge and that means dollars to a farmer. So we want to collect that data um, so we can optimize production efficiency and quality 
and we then also want to minimise risk and environmental impact. So drones from the perspective of an agricultural person could enable us to do better in the smart food production game, almost certainly enables us to do better in the smart environmental management game, and for us as educators, smart skills development because it's lots of skills involved and it's fun to do. And one of the things we have in the Australian sector, actually it's worldwide, is difficulty in getting students into the agricultural industry sector, and I'm meaning across the board, not just you know grains or horticulture, but across the board. So at UQ, we've got five DJ Phantoms that we use for teaching. We've got four bespoke quad copters, we've got three bespoke hexacopters and ten mini agricultural drones which are the ones nowadays because these other ones that I've talked about, the ten mini ag drones are the ones that we use and I'll just talk a little bit about them in the next few minutes. They're easy to fly and there is an article out in 2015 about what, why we're doing this and what we're doing. The design and build principles around these, this business of getting students of all disciplines to understand what they're doing, we go through a design process, trial and error, using open software to look at designing these things. We purchase the parts for them, we, they build them, they test fly or they learn to fly, learn to solder, things like this, um, undertake the project and write a report. So this is an, a, a classic problem-based learning or active learning scheme that we can make, get students to do. Here are the types of drones that we've investigated and used over time. You can see there's a certain date range here. And as much as anything else, this small mini UQ mini ag drone we designed and built because we under, we want to fly under the two kilo limit of CASA because if we had to get every student um, certified, we couldn't do this. Um, so this little mini ag drone, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail a little bit down the track, is the one that we're now flying. And it, this with a camera that looks at getting a normalised difference vegetation index image um, is less than one kilo. So the first student project was in 2013 where the student literally took a DJI Phantom with a little normal uh, red, green, blue um, visual camera back to Fiji. This was his school in 2003, this is a Google map. This is his school in 2013, which is the image that you can see outlined here. And he, he literally calculated the difference in mango clearing, basically. So he looked at change in mango. So this was the first project that we looked at. Then we started getting a little bit more creative. We developed a drone that could carry a multispectral camera. And we started looking at... Um, Prickly acacia, which is a serious weed, environmental weed up in central Queensland, big problem from an agricultural perspective because it sh shuts out cattle from using the pasture underneath. And we compared some of that data to satellite data and found, of course, that these drones creating a better resolution on the ground gave us more data. This beneficial bug drone, <clears throat> a hexacopter weighing around about 2 kg, more when we've got this white thing underneath it, designed by an agricultural science student which is now going to the, has been invited to be put on display at the Science and Technology Museum in London for the next five years in their um, display on innovations in agriculture over time. So this is actually an old innovation now. This is about 2013, um, 2014, but it is an instance of when people started looking at uh, using drones. So this is a... Um, a box full of beneficial bugs, which the farming industry, the farm group that we worked with, uh, wanted to see if they could develop, drop beneficial bugs, these bits coming out, um, into the middle of a paddock instead of, as they customarily do, drive around the outside. And so this was a very successful product project with industry involvement that then started really introducing this sort of technology from the education, from the classroom, into the actual agricultural space, so that was great. The net drone was another one where we were asked to fly under hail netting for one of the largest seedling producers in Australia, and here is the netting. You can see it's a lovely picture if, if, if you appreciate it, this sort of colour variation. The drone is flying here, and it was called the Net Drone Project. We were looking to see which one of these seedlings in you know 250,000 small tube plants were germinating or not. And here you could see this sort of um, resolution that you could pick up from a standard um, RB, uh, standard multispectral camera. You could see the two cotyledon stage here. And you could introduce students to the idea that you are looking at 
three different bands, so a little bit of physics, you're looking a little bit of uh, spatial variation because you can see where in this one where my cursor is, where things haven't grown, and then when you go up here, at two cotyledon stage, you get that interest for a student in so much they can actually see a plant germinating and they can see where it has not. And what you do is you get them to calculate what the cost is to both the supplier and the buyer when they get a tray of seedlings and something hasn't germinated. So that links it to the eco economics of the producer. Here is our mini ag drone. We've been flying it now for a couple of years. We've used it at the beginning of this year for 35 students to do some projects. It's based on Raspberry Pi technology. We've upgraded it because we found that the GPS wasn't crash hot, but in this sort of thing, I've got 10 drones which might cost me 100 bucks each to repair, but that means that students can crash them. And that, that's good for a student to be able to do that. And over here, you can see them flying in, in, um, on campus. The sort of data that you can get out of this quite basic, uh, no IR or an NDVI data camera, is you can pick up this information quite nicely at an operational scale. So again, I'm trying, I'm, I'm guess I'm not at that, I'm not trying to get these students to be <clears throat> as knowledgeable as we might think from a research perspective, but at undergraduate level three agricultural science student, they go out with this knowledge and will then be able to develop their skills in the real world after that. We are developing various sensors that can fit onto this small camera, so the most recent one is a multispectral sensor, again multiplexed up Raspberry Pi cameras that enable us to choose very high grade research filters of specific wavelengths when we're wanting to look at something. And this particular camera at the moment is being used on top of one of our IoT multi-sensor mesh network to collect aerial data of the biomass of that paddock across which of some 50 hectares, I believe, uh, that have, has a multi-sensor mesh network on it. So this camera is, is, is now working. So this was when it was being developed. You can see how it's been set up, four little Raspberry Pi cameras, and we use uh, Python to make sure everything goes well. This is a drone that is no longer flying, but it was a, an attempt at us delivering a drone that could pick up the RFID tags in a cow's ear from a distance, and it works at about 20 meters, but you know, we're talking a big drone now with a big antenna, and whilst it worked, from an operational perspective and from the idea of trying to keep things down to a level where we're not flying above CASA's regulations, this became <clears throat> essentially unusable, and although I have an engineering student who wishes to try and reduce this in size, this is something that we're not, at the moment, moving forward to, but it is an idea, it's an example of some of the ideas that come when you start talking to the industry players and asking them what they want. They, they wanted something like this because normally you have to stand behind, beside the cow or the cow has to go through some cattle gates and literally swipe it with a hand swiper. You've got you know, a thousand head of cattle, that's a really difficult, a really time consuming thing to do. So this was about trying to improve the efficiency of being able to look at these cows in, in the paddock and the sort of data we could get from it was, was, was really quite good. Sorts of types and research and learning involved is electronics and avionics, which is not normal in an agricultural sense, but is really useful if you're going to get into this side of spatial variability analysis, the design and build side of things. We look at programming, physics, maths, and chemistry, of course, because we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, things like spectral indices and crop growth indices, and chemicals in plants. So if you're trying to engage a student in learning about maths, which they really don't want to do, you bring in something like this, and it changes their perception of both learning about the maths and then how it can be used in real life when it would appear to be, from a classroom perspective, completely dry and equation-driven. Um, plant physiology, animal welfare, and food traceability are all issues around management that we can also talk about when we use these tools. And most recently, we've had these sorts of projects going on, drone and sensor development for crop monitoring and diseases computer vision um, development for monitoring um, pests, basically, but we could be doing it in the piggery or we could be doing it out in the environment for, say, wildlife people. Uh, we've got a, a Master of Engineering student looking at developing a robotic arm for capturing these small drones out of the sky <clears throat> for autom autonomous recharging. Um, again, it's an, it's an academic project, probably not to, not to be... Um, used operationally because of the issue of autonomous flight, um, but 
very useful for the master engineering student to understand why we want that from an agricultural perspective. So we want to increase, obviously, the reach of our drones flying. And then we've had people developing automated underwater cameras to monitor phytoplankton, which we can then link to our IoT and, and our aerial imagery of the lakes. Obviously, the IoT has applicability elsewhere that may not involve drones, like in the equine health area. And the development of this visualization dashboard for our um, monitoring purposes and for staff to access, and as I say, anyone on Edurome, to, div to access some of this um, data that we're collecting. And as I say, this is a project, the RFID monitoring of cattle is something that we're that we're still sort of looking at, but the idea is to reduce it in size as the electronics become smaller and we don't have to have such a big antenna involved, which means a bigger drone and more weight, etc., and, and start starting to contravene CASA regulations. So we're looking at a whole range of things, both from an education and research perspective, um, but mainly the research is about getting, is about interesting students in learning about this stuff, which I think is going to be key down the track in terms of capability development for our industry, both agricultural and environment, or managed landscapes, um, because without these kids coming in, we're, we're going to run out of people in terms of, <laughs> as they get older, they're not going to be able to continue to do this. So, that's my presentation, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Hi, Kim. Thank you. And I will move on to the next presenter, Tim Brown. Thank you for having me on. That was a very interesting talk, Kim. I'm going to be talking about our work at the National Arboretum in Canberra using drones to uh, make 3D models of the arboretum growing. I'm the director of the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility at ANU, and a lot of this work was done when I was working for the ARC Center of Plant Energy Biology as a research fellow, and um, I should first off say thanks to all the people listed there that have been essential to this project. So I wasn't quite sure what level of understanding people would have on this. Um, drones are part of a, as Kim pointed out, they're part of a key emerging tool set for next-gen monitoring of the environment, and these make up sensors, uh, high-resolution imaging, LIDAR, and a whole bunch of other things that let us measure the environment in ways we never could before. And since I've been working in the phenomics field, really we're interested in how you monitor the environment along with genetics so you can measure the phenotype, because those are the things together that define how ecosystems develop. and in a crop context, you know, the, the phenotype is essentially what we want for increasing food yields. So a bit of background on UAVs, I think a bit of this has been covered, so I'll go through it quite quickly. But you basically have a lot of choices if you're starting a drone program from the sort of low-cost hex rotors like these quad and hex rotors like the DJI Phantom. These things are changing so fast, so I used to give this talk and say that drones were expensive and confusing, and then I said that they were cheap but still a bit confusing, and now they're just cheap and easy to use. Um, the, the DJI Mavic Pro came out this year. It's a very tiny drone, but it still has a 12 megapixel camera on it. You can throw it in a backpack and you can still do pretty decent monitoring with it um, at the low end of the things. These sorts of drones typically cost in the one to $2,000 range, although the bigger ones like this one here cost more in the $8,000 range. And you get something like 15 to 20 minutes flight time and up to 10 kilogram payload for the really big ones. You can also use fixed wing drones, so these give you a longer flight time, something in the 30 to 60 minute range, but you do have to have takeoff and landing issues, and the, they, they can have higher payloads, but they do tend to fly faster, which impacts how you can monitor with them. A new system that's being developed by people that we work with at uh, Pro UAV is this vertical takeoff and landing system, and we really think this is going to be an amazing tool because it gives you both the benefits of a fixed wing and some sort of a copter because with, a, with a, the helicopter part of it, it can take off straight so it doesn't need a landing zone or runway. And if something goes wrong and the, and the gas motors fail, it will catch itself and land. So you can put, you can carry quite a heavy payload and you can put really expensive equipment on it because it's quite robust. On the camera side, as Kim pointed out, you have a lot of options ranging from RGB cameras, the, the onboard cameras on the Phantom work quite well, all the way up to DSLRs. But you do need to, to watch about what cameras you're using and isolate them from vibration or you get rolling shutter issues where the, uh, the camera is trying to take a photo but the sensor is not writing all the data at once and so when there's vibration you end up with bad data. The sort of next step up, unless you're building your one, one yourself, like Ken pointed out, um, is 
is the multi-spectral cameras that can get you NDVI. And the the main thing that people use now are either the Micasense, Sequoia, or Red Edge, and those are in the three to five thousand dollar range. There are a lot of other sensors, so you can put hyperspectral cameras on your drones or thermal, and you can so you can get you know bands in the 400 to 1300 nanometer range. But they, you need a big quadcopter because they're heavy, they're very expensive, and the data is quite hard to process. So there really is a range of stuff available from really easy to use up to quite challenging, depending on what, what output you need. The typical outputs you get from 3D reconstruction software, which is a lot of what I'll be talking about, are um, orthomosaic images. So these are sort of essentially satellite layers that you can put into Google Maps or Mapbox. Um, and then also DEMs and GeoTIFFs. And, some of the software can actually give you somewhat classified outputs or remove the ground so you only get trees. can provide you with RGB, multispectral, or hyperspectral indices, and also 3D point clouds, and then you can make a 3D model of your environment as well if that's what you're interested in. There are a lot of options on the 3D reconstruction software front, and I'll just go through a few. It's important to know that it requires a pretty beefy PC to run these things, so you're looking at probably 1500 Australian dollars to get a PC because you need a fair bit of RAM, you need a pretty good processor, and then you need a graphics card. Pix4D Mapper Pro, which is the one that we've been using because it was about the only one available when we started working, it ranges from $2,000 to about $9,000 depending on what license you get, and you have to pay a, about $1,000 a year for support. It also has a challenge that you can only run on Windows so if you want to run it on a server or on the Amazon cloud for much bigger data processing or for automating stuff, you have to get the pro license. The other one people use a lot is AggieSoft PhotoScan. I haven't used it personally, but it's been well recommended. Um, the cheap version, if you just want 3D models, is about $60 US and about $550 academic, and then pricing goes up from there. And those also will run on the cloud if you buy the pro version. Mosaic Mill is another software package. It's the last quote I got from them was about 4,500 euros. Uh, it comes in a lot of flavors, but I haven't used it. There's a free software package called Visual SFM, which is FSM, which uh, seems to work pretty well because it's free and somewhat open source software. You know, it, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles the expensive ones do, but if you have more time than you do um, money for your project, it's, it's probably a good thing to explore. There are also a lot of online options, and these are great for testing, so if you either just do occasional flights and don't want to invest in the software in the PC, or you want really fast processing, or you're preparing a grant proposal, so you just need to get some initial data, websites like these ones let you just upload your, your images and give you a point cloud and other data quite quickly. A disclaimer, this is not a complete list, and all of these prices change rapidly and frequently, so check, check the vendors for pricing, and, and don't take my word for it. There's plenty of other information out there. But you see from these sorts of software, you can take a flight like you see on the left side here, and then you get a 3D reconstruction on the forest, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So the, the site where we've been flying drones is at the National Arboretum in Canberra, and this is a really great site because it's just five kilometers from ANU and has fast Wi-Fi. The last site I worked at was in southern Utah, and it took about five hours to drive each direction. So when something broke, it was you know a good day and a half just to get there and back. And having a, a field site where you have Wi-Fi access from your desk and you can drive out there in five minutes really makes it easy to test new and uh, emerging technologies until they're ready for deploying elsewhere. And also, the forest was only planted about seven years ago, so we have an opportunity to monitor this, this forest and build a three-dimensional model of the entire arboretum growing in, in, into the future, which has basically never been possible before. So we um, initially, at the ANU research site, we installed a 20-node wireless mesh sensor network, Campbell weather stations for baseline data, um, some gigapixel cameras. These are cameras that take hundreds or thousands of high-resolution images that you squish together to get a multi-billion resolution picture. We've done some LiDAR scans, both uh, on the ground from various sorts, and then we've done near-monthly UAV flights. And once you sequence the trees out there, because tree sequencing is getting down to you know the ten to twenty dollar per tree range, you can really measure phenotype, environment, and genetics in a way that gives you an amazing density of data about a space that we were never able to access before. So here's uh, Canberra on the southeast side of Australia. The uh, arboretum is over on the west side of Canberra, south of Black Mountain. If you've been there, 
This is our main field area. This is a picture of what it looks like from one of the cameras up on the hill. So this is a 500 megapixel image that we generate every hour. And you can zoom all the way into that image to see the forest out on the far side there. This is what that forest looks like when you fly over it with a drone. And then from the drone data, you can bring that into Pix4D, as I'll show in a second, and get a three-dimensional model of the trees. So the, the drone monitoring program, the, the goal was to test and develop a time series drone monitoring program so we could get 3D models of the trees growing. We get time-lapse geo-rectified image layers, a 3D point cloud, and then some phenotypes we can measure, like tree height, area as measured by top-down pixels and color data over time. And this forest we're studying is, um, it's 12 forests of spotted gum and iron bark was planted in about 2012 and it's four hectares. So it's really a perfect size for drone monitoring because you can fly the whole site in about 15 minutes. It's not too hard to process and it's, it's very amenable to that sort of monitoring. We've really come a long way on this. So in April 2013, I flew the first drone over it, which was a cell phone duct tape to a drone that I'd made at home. And now we're using a really nice solid uh, Matrix Pro by DJI with Daryl from Pro UAV who's been flying it for us and really good cameras. And so we're really getting a lot of solid data. But just in the last four years, this tech, five years, this technology has changed so much. The typical workflow in this is uh, Pix4D is a software that we use. You, it pulls in all the images you can see here that were taken from the drone and then you can see on the left all those green lines going down are key points that is detected in all of the images. And there's, there's really a lot of black magic that happens behind the scenes in these software packages. And you can see on the right, those are some little tiny piece of ground that the software has detected as being the same in about 30 different photos. And it uses that to calculate the actual position of each photo relative to the ground. Those are called control points. From that, it creates the 3D point cloud as you can see here, and that gives you uh, this sort of ghostly 3D model of, of your entire forest. You can see that there's some data missing from the bottom because the trees are, the, the drones are just looking down from the top and can't see around the edges of the trees. The total processing time to do this is very hardware dependent, so it ranges from like three to 12 hours, but it allows you to go from, from uh, pictures to point clouds to three-dimensional models of the tree, as you can see here. It's important to realize how groundbreaking this technology is because, um, you know, previously if you wanted to measure the location and height of every tree, it would have taken you an incredibly long time. There are 2,000 trees in this forest, and we can do this now in about a morning. But there still are a lot of challenges, as Gur was pointing out, with, with, working up, with working with and serving up the data. And so we developed, uh, we implemented a point cloud viewer called Poetry on our website, TradeCapture.org, you can go there and see some of the point clouds that we have online. And we wrote a software package called um, Forest Utils that runs on Python that lets us pull out the locations and height of every tree and, and the point cloud data associated with that tree. So this, this assumes an open canopy. If you have a closed canopy, things are a bit harder unless you have GPS locations for your trees. But now once we have the, the, the tree locations, when the canopy closes, we can keep tracking them and it outputs tree height, top-down area, location, RGB colors, and a point count, which is a measure of how many, how many points were generated for that tree. And it also spits out a CSV map that you can just, a CSV file that you can just stick on uh, Google Maps or anywhere you want that has all of your tree locations. So that, that's the program we ran. We, we've probably flown 30 flights over the last, uh, since, since mid-2015. And I want to talk a little bit about data management because it's, this is really crucial. And if you're, you're planning to do anything more than just occasional flights, you really need to come up with a good data management plan. And you want to do this before you start your surveys. And it's important to consider the entire workflow, right? Because it's not just who captures it or what happens to it, but the entire process. You have to think of who does the surveys. If you have more than one company or more than one person, the data has to get to you somehow. It has to get processed. You have to figure out where it goes on your computer and track it. You know, in, until people like Turn have made us nice tools for having our data go seamlessly online, it's, you have to manage all of this stuff yourself until it gets to the point where you publish it. You have to figure out smart ways for naming things, and you know, you may get a data set and then add to it, and then add to it again, and then process it. And the, you need some sort of workflow that tracks how that how that is taking place. And doing that across thousands of images or hundreds of flights can really be a challenge. And if people upload data, you need to make sure that they've told you how much data they have so that you can have all of it so you don't spend a week 
processing their, their data and then find out that they hadn't finished uploading it and you needed to add another 100 images and run the entire thing again. Often you run into problems like we store all of our data on a large data server at the Research School of Biology, but we process it on a computer that's local and has an SSD, so we have to move, the data gets uploaded into one folder by whoever, sh whoever took it, gets moved to another folder, which is the storage folder, and then gets copied to this computer to process and then has to be copied back with the, the new data as well. And so that, that makes it quite hard to track things over time. And, you know, if experiments fail or new data comes in, you need to have a workflow for how you know where things are and what, what the status of them is. So it's really best to enforce, enforce rigorous note taking. Um, even just having people, you know, whatever tech is running the project, writing down what they're doing as they do it can be really happy, handy. Also shared Google Docs and Notepad++ so you can put just files within each folder can be really useful. So here's an example of the naming structure that we settled on and uh, basically the idea was to make when someone looks in a folder to make it reasonably human usable. So we have the year, location, site, who captured it and the status. In this case it was um, the National Forest and National Arboretum, the ANU forest plot, actually this was Pro UAV that captured that one and we wrote that it was done and uploaded. So this seems like a great idea, but of course, if you have any sort of nested folders, like you might want to name your data set National Arboretum, the file names get rapidly too long for Windows and your entire process fails. So this makes it a challenge because you need metadata, but you have to have someone who actually is maintaining it. And as I said, shared Google Docs are good, but this isn't really a solved problem. And also, you know, Everyone always ends up with files like this because before we implemented a data management plan, things were just going onto my laptop and then getting copied into random places. I think I think a lot of people get flummoxed by data management because it's really hard, but it's not easy for anyone, and it's easy to think that you don't know what you're doing, but I'm not sure that anybody really does. And um, you won't get things right the first time, and you, you have to start with a plan and keep working at it and just acknowledge that it's not going to work the way you expected as soon as you as soon as you start to implement it and then you need to go back and change it because in reality our data data management typically looks something like that and we want to move it more towards the vision but it isn't actually there but it, you, need, you need to address these problems because they end up making your data unusable when we have these large-scale huge time series data sets. Some other challenges with processing drone data are that um, they're for this new these new kinds of three-dimensional data so for things like NDVI um, or some of the met metrics that Kim was mentioning, that there's a lot of known information about that because people have been working with that sort of data for a long time. But a lot of data, like a, th a three-dimensional point cloud of a tree, it it's hard to know how you tie data values like that to biologically meaningful things. And it's also challenging getting back to what Gur was talking about with the, the provenance of the data and tracking what's been processed. You know, you can, you can process the same project in three different versions of PIC4D and get three different outputs. And there's also about a hundred different ways you can vary the settings. So at one point recently we decided to test every single setting we could think of in PIC4D and you can see an output from that table here. And using exactly the same images you can get a stitching time ranging from five minutes to 55 minutes and point cloud sizes ranging from 44 million points down to 11 million points. And it's easy to think, for example, that more points means more data, but if you happen to be taking pictures on a windy day and your tree is moving around, you probably want, your, your data doesn't have the resolution of a leaf, it just has the revolu resolution of the height and structure of a tree. So it may be that either the less points is actually a better measurement of that tree volume or somewhere in between. But it's really hard to ground truth these things because there isn't any way to go out and measure that volume of the tree anyway else. It's also important to choose the right tool for the job. So drones are really great, people are using them for good reason with lots of things but they're best suited for smaller areas like maybe less than 20 hectares. And a good example of this is that because we've been flying the Arboretum so much, we would all wanted to do a full Arboretum survey so that we could get a 3D point cloud and model the entire Arboretum and measure the height of every tree in the Arboretum. I think it's about 35,000 trees that they have out there. So we finally got the funding to do this. We got Daryl in to fly it, and it ended up being a huge project. It took many weeks of planning. Um, there were four or five flight days required. You have to have multiple staff on site because when you're flying an area that large, you can't fly over people. So it's easy to follow CASA regulations when you're just a remote forest, but when you're trying to find fly over a 250-hectare area that's open to the public, it becomes much harder. We ended up with 8,800 RGB images, and 
more than 12,000 images from the Sequoia. It ultimately took about two months of manual processing because we had to break everything into smaller subsets because the full cloud couldn't run on any machines. None of the online folks can handle more than about 500 images, so we couldn't just throw it at one of the cloud services. And we ended up with a point cloud that had 584 million data points. So it is important to consider what workflow you will use. So this is something we know we could probably do this once a year max, but if you add up the time cost of it, it becomes prohibitively expensive to do this at this point with the technology available. And for something like that, it might be better to fly a plane over the Arboretum, for instance. It's also, if you're thinking of setting up a, um, a monitoring plan, you need to consider weather and distance to the side and accessibility and time of day, because if you want to fly your all of your plots at the same time of day, say around noon, you have to drive between sites. You can't do that on the same day. And sometimes it turns out that just putting a camera in so you can get consistent data, even though it's not as maybe high resolution, might be a better option, or using satellite data. And again, for example, um, a lot of the local agricultural monitoring, it turns out it's cheaper to do it by helicopter because you might want to fly five flights, fly five sites in the same day. And with a helicopter, you can do that in about an hour. It might cost you a couple thousand dollars, but that's cheaper than trying to drive around to five sites over the course of a week and flying a drone. And you can put a much heavier payload on a helicopter. So this is the point. This is the point cloud we got out of the arboretum. Again, if you go to trade capture, you can you can go around and explore it. It looks pretty good, but you can see there are some artifacts where the the stitches didn't align up perfectly because we we're doing had to do it in pieces. So get on choosing the right tool for the job. Um, Larger scale surveys are not necessarily best to do with a drone. And there was an interesting article from Frontiers in the Ecology of the Environment last year where they looked at doing uh, UAV surveys in Alaska. And it turned out that it was $1,700 per site to use a UAS, but only $400 per site to use a plane, mainly because the, the sites were quite far apart. So it's an important consideration. Now, in the future, I think what we all want is self-driving sw drone swarms that fly over our forest or field daily. We have all this data uploaded and processed in the cloud and get near real-time analytics to the farmer or the end user. And I've been wanting someone to release something like this for years. And finally, this year, a country called X Aircraft in China and a group in uh, Sydney called Revolution Ag are starting to release this system. So here's an agricultural UAV. It can carry pesticides or water or nutrients, or fertilizer, and they can fly themselves. So of course, there are regulatory issues around this. But we're, we're getting close to the point where we can have a, sw a, a swarm of drones that's just monitoring our sites continuously. And in the future, as micro drones get, get better and higher quality, they, they may be more feasible and safer, particularly for um, field monitoring, where maybe there aren't going to be people there. Because you can imagine a small, a small study, you pay $10,000 and get 500 of these drones, and they take off every day and fly around your forest and come back. They're all solar powered. They live on a tower somewhere. That would be a really amazing processing solution to give you continuous three-dimensional data of your of your research site. So some thoughts on developing a drone program. Drones and sensors are a crucial component for field monitoring and phenotyping, but it is hard to do. There's a lot of technology available, so you want to focus on the deliverables. Who are your stakeholders or customers, and what do they need to know? What would be actionable information for them? It's easy to say, oh, yeah, let's just get a drone, and then realize afterwards that you're not you haven't really figured out what kind of data you're going to deliver, deliver. And then working back from that, you can figure out how big the area is, what the full costing is, and so on. I think I covered a lot of this. And then also, you want to start small and get your pipeline working. So you don't want to start off flying the 250 hectares of the Arboretum. You want to have done the smaller forest first. You want to make sure the UAV you buy is the correct one, and whether or not it might just be cheaper to subcontract. And when you process the data, you need to decide if you're going to outsource it or do it yourself. And if you need to develop novel tools, are there groups already doing this stuff? And how can you share this with others so that we all have t good tools to use for processing these sorts of data? And again, don't underestimate how hard data management is and have a plan in place at the start. I think we're running out of time, so um, I'll run through this really quickly. To uh, I just want to say that all of this data is incredibly it's new and it's incredibly hard to manage because it's three dimensions and it's got multiple layers and time series and we don't have tools for this that that we used to like the tools that we normally use for data visualization and management are not usable for the tool sets that we have now so we need a sort of MATLAB, Excel or GIS for time series three-dimensional hyperspectral data and this doesn't exist yet 
So uh, there's a couple of groups at the NCI that are developing point cloud viewers. There's a, we're working with um, the VizLab to make a time-lapse virtual reality and Windows-based uh, point cloud viewer. And if you if you search for Adam Steer at NCI, he's working on a um, NCI-backed one, which would be really great because then groups like Turn and us could dump all of our data in the same spot on NCI, and we'd have these real-time tools for pulling point clouds out on the fly. And just the last thing, I'll go through this quick because I know we're out of time. Um, one thing that I wanted to do once I started getting three-dimensional data is be able to visualize all the sensor and point cloud data on the landscape where it was collected because that, that's a way to me that helps helps you really see the the data in the context of, of where it was collected and, and the place that you're monitoring. So I collaborated with some groups, in the, with some students in the computer science department and we made a, uh, a virtual reality three-dimensional model of the National Arboretum using all the drone data as well as our sensor data. Essentially what you can do is you can take three-dimensional modeling software developed by Hollywood and use it to reproduce your landscape but rather than using the whatever data they're using for a movie, you can use your data from your drone flights to generate the three-dimensional models. And so this is an example of, of the, the project for the National Arboretum. Here are the drone, the drone flight data. There's the three-dimensional forest that we get out of it. This is the virtual reality version of it where we've uh, taken the digital elevation model to, have a, to generate the landscape and then put the trees in at the locations that the drone data measured. When you interact with the trees, they show you their metadata. So in this case, we're showing height and area of each tree. And then you can also map onto the landscape and play back in time series the, uh, the different data types that we're collecting with the mesh sensors. So this is a really great tool for pulling all of these dense data layers together and visualizing them in one spot to help us make sense of this incredibly complex data. And I think we should all consider this is just the beginning, right? So when I was a kid, I used to play Atari, and this is what it looked like. And now this is, you know, the, the same dragon games that my kids play. And we're at the Atari stage in VR and in our ability to measure the world continuously in 3D. And in 10 years, VR and AR are going to be indistinguishable from reality. So the question is, what do we do with these tools? And how do we create the next generation of interfaces that facilitate ecosystem research and how we build monitoring and... Um, monitoring programs that make best use of all these data types so we can really model our environment in three dimensions and solve the grand challenges of the of this century. There are lots of people to thank, but uh, I think I'm out of time, so thanks. Excellent uh, presentation, Tim. Thank you for joining us, and look forward to see you again in the future.